Ola Isaksson. I'm the um, uh, head of the research group here, Chalmers for Systems and Engineering Design, where uh, Dr. Massimo Palarotto is doing his research. And uh, today he will uh, present his uh, compulsory lecture for the confirmation of descent or associate professor. In. And uh, after the presentation, which is roughly 40 minutes, 20, 35, 40 minutes, something. You will be given the opportunity to ask questions and discuss the topic. And um, without further ado, I give the floor to Massimo Panarotto. Please, welcome. Thank you, Ola. So, welcome everybody to my uh, presentation, which uh, uh, is titled Multi Technology Integrated Products Can Their Value Be Assessed During Design? And uh, I am Massimo Panarotto. I'm a researcher here at the Department of Industrial and Material Science in the Systems Engineering Design Group. So first, I will talk a little bit about myself so you know who I am. So I was born in Verona, in Italy, in the northeast of Italy, so very close to Venice. And uh, I got my PhD in uh, mechanical engineering at the University of Padua in 2011. And Padua is also very close to Verona. And before getting my degree, I moved to uh, Lulio, University of Technology, where I did my master thesis in product innovation in, in 2010. So uh, there I it grew my interest for, uh, for the engineering design and especially for research in engineering design. And this is why after that, I, I accepted an offer as a PhD student at Blakingy Institute of Technology in Karlskrona. And this is why you can see that basically ended up in the middle between uh, Lulio and Verona. And there I did my, my PhD in value analysis and value assessment. And I worked especially with the automotive and construction equipment sectors. And after that, I moved to Chalmers in 2017 and I became a research fellow at the University of Techno uh, Chalmers University of Technology. And uh, now I am a research lead in, in basically two projects the Kyops project and the Define projects, which I'm going to introduce quite soon. Uh, so basically, if I, uh, if I would have to describe my skills, uh, then to describe them, I visualize them in this way, that is, if some of you are familiar with FIFA, this is the way that FIFA describes the skills of football players. So I decided to use this uh, visualization. And basically, I would say that my skills are within value-driven design, which is my research area, then in systems engineering design, which is my research group, and then I have skills in design research methodology. So I would say that I apply design research methodology to understand the systems engineering design problems, and for those problems that I observe and I understand, then I develop value-driven design methods and tools. Also from, uh, uh, well, from my private life, so I enjoy a lot of drink and food. Uh, and also I've been, uh, I played football for many years as a forward. So, but as you can see from my scores, I, I have not succeeded that much. So this is why I'm not in the real FIFA and I, I had to, to make my own FIFA music. So then, uh, Research-wise, where I work on, so I work basically in, uh, in three main sectors. One is the space sector. Uh, so basically I work in two different, uh, in two different projects and which are one is continuing the other and are going until 2024. And this is the Keops project, which I will talk a little bit more about uh, in this presentation because basically this, this sector is the one where I have most examples uh, so we report a lot from this project. Then I work in the aeronautics sector, uh, especially in this defined project who, who has been recently granted. And then I work in the automotive sector and I work uh, basically with the, with the Volvo companies. So the agenda is that I'm going to talk about multi-technology integrated products. So I will give three main reasons for integrating new technologies from different domains into products. And then I will explain why this is providing challenges for us engineers when it comes to deciding 
which technologies to integrate into products. And after this then, I will give uh, examples of the value uh, methods and tools, value methodologies that I developed, in, especially in, uh, in the KELPS project. And so I will give, um, I will give basically the industrial case studies from, uh, from the KELPS project where we look into electric propulsion systems for satellite. So also you will learn hopefully a little bit about electric propulsion uh, today. So multi-technology integrated products. Why did I choose the word uh, multi-technology integrated products and not only technology integrated products? Well, when I, by multi, I mean that they are from different domains. So in, in engineering, we are increasingly integrating technologies from different domains into products. And to visualize this, I show basically the electric, the evolution of the, the electric architectures from the 50s to the 2020s. So we can see in the 50s that the car was basically a hardware product, a mechanical product with some electronic inside. And as we can see, moving into the 2020s, so there is much, much more electronics and software integrated into cars. So we can say that basically today, we do not know anymore if a car, it's a hardware product with some electronics on top, or actually if it is a computer with some steel and some wheels around. And uh, I will give now some of the reasons why this is happening. And I will also explain you some of the, re some of the challenges that we engineers encounter when deciding, uh, when deciding on which technologies to integrate. So the first reason is uh, for integrating new technologies is to improve the functionality and the performances of a product. And to explain this, uh, I will use uh, an example that is related to the history of brakes. So if we go back to a couple of centuries, we had a wooden brake in, uh, uh, in these vehicles. So the function of a, of a wooden brake was to reduce the vehicle motion of a wheel. And for doing this, we just required to perform two additional functions to create friction with the wheel, and then we had a wooden block that was linked up. And then we had to amplify the user input force. And this was done with a mechanical lever. So then the wooden block had to be connected mechanically with the wheel to produce the friction. And the wooden block had to be connected mechanically with the lever in order to fulfill this function. So then the wooden brake was used for many centuries until uh, the beginning of the 1900, where Louis Renault invented a new concept for fulfilling the function of reducing the vehicle motion with the drum brake. In the drum brake, as you can see, many more functions had to be performed in order to fulfill this main function, and many more elements had to be introduced. And many more elements had to be mechanically connected with each other. For example, the drum, the brake shoes, the springs, and a mechanical lever. So you can see that the system has quite quickly increased in complexity, even from just visually from these interactions. But so why did the mechanical drum brake overtook the wooden brake so quickly? Well, because it provided more value. And if we use some, uh, a definition of value that is given by Miles, that is quite a standard when it comes to value engineering. But basically, Miles says that the, the value of a product is the function that is supposed to fulfill divided by the cost. So if we just compare our wooden brake with the mechanical brake, so the function of the brakes is to reduce the vehicle motion. And if we take the wooden brake as a benchmark, we can say that the mechanical drum brake is fulfilling the function of reducing the vehicle motion much more. So this is why it overtook over the, uh, it took over the wooden brake because it was fulfilling, it was increasing the performances of the product to a new level. Then the same happened for further enhancement of the drum brake concept. For example, when in 1918, it was introduced a, a hydraulic brake. 
So a hydraulic brake was taking the same elements of a mechanical drum brake, but it was improving one function. It was improving the function of amplifying the user input force. So in a mechanical drum brake, we have a mechanical lever still to perform, to amplify the user input force. Instead of an hydraulic brake was using an hydraulic system to do that. And for doing this, many more sub-functions were introduced and many more elements were introduced. So the, as you can see from the interactions that I show, the system increased in complexity. But also another thing that we started to have not only mechanical connections between the elements, such as in the mechanical brakes, but we started to have new connections such as fluid. For example, the oil that was going, that was going through the cylinder and the piston. And I visualize these hydraulic interactions in blue. So we have started now not only to have a mechanical system, but to have an, uh, hydromechanical, a hydromechanical system. So now we have introduced a new domain. And if we go and, and why then the hydraulic brake took over the mechanical drum brake is again because it was fulfilling, it was reducing the vehicle motion at the better level compared to the mechanical brake. At the same time, the system complexity was increased. So we can say basically that the cost of this break was increased because the complexity was increased. If we move into further developments of the brake system, we can actually observe in the early 2000s that we had a concept for a re regenerative break. So the regenerative break is, doing, is fulfilling the same function of an hydraulic brake, reducing the vehicle motion, but what it's doing is that it's introducing a new function that was not in the, in the brakes before. And this one is, for example, generating energy from the motion. So now this one is trying to increase value, this concept, by introducing a new function that was not there before. And then many more sub-functions had to be fulfilled and many more new elements had to be introduced, such as sensors, and a brake control unit. And you can see here that we have new domains that are integrated into the product. So we do not have only have mechanical and hydraulic, but now we have even electronics and software, which here are visualized in green and in gray. So we start to have an introduction of many more domains into a product that originally was basically only mechanical. And again, if you take our value function, the function of the system is in increased because we are basically keeping the same, reducing vehicle motion function, but we are introducing a new function in the system. But at the same time, the product cost is increasing because we have new elements that are introduced, such as electronics and software. So basically one of the problems when, uh, when, we, have, when we are introducing new technologies is that we have all the, the trade-off between uh, the benefits that we gain from adding a new technology to increase functionality and the complexity that we add to the system, which leads to cost and risk for the manufacturer. So often we have to balance this trade-off between the functionality that we can improve and the cost that we can uh, sustain as a manufacturer. But, so there are new technologies that are really upcoming that actually may be neglected if we only look at our value function that is only considering the function that the product is fulfilling versus the cost. And for this, I will give the example uh, of, uh, of an electric car. So in an electric car, if we take the function of storing energy that uh, can be measured in watt hour per kilo versus the cost, then we can map the technologies that are more efficient when it comes to that storing energy function. And we can see that the more, the more efficient are the lithium ion battery that, for example, you can find in Tesla today. So one conclusion from here would be, okay, if we want to increase the value of the system, we need to increase, basically, we, have, we need to have more lithium ion battery in the vehicle. But the problem, that if we are increasing the lithium ion, the battery in the vehicle, the weight is going to increase. So this means that we need even more batteries, which are going to increase even more 
the way to the vehicle. So at the end, this technology, we have a technology that potentially provides value, but at the system level, it doesn't. So only looking at this value function doesn't, uh, doesn't really capture how we can increase the value of a system. For example, when we, when we have technologies that actually uh, work and with a very different behavior compared to current technologies. And for this, I take the example of a structural battery, which is actually the, um, is actually co-research here at Chalmers from Professor Leif Asp. So the concept of a structural battery is basically that we are, uh, we are integrating uh, we are using composites that are in the body of a vehicle. We can use them as a battery. So we have that the uh, that we we have the, the 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 body panels of the vehicle are actually the battery. And this one can dramatically reduce the vehicle weight because we can remove batteries, for example, for well the battery of the vehicle, but also the wiring. We can use them for sensing. We can use for her energy harvesting and the acoustic management. This means that the system weight can be reduced by using structural batteries. And if we look at our value function then, what is special about uh, our value function is that if we only look at the function of storing energy and cost, then the structural batteries are not performing, are performing worse than current lithium ion batteries. But the benefit is at system level because they are basically taking another function that is maintaining structural integrity that today is fulfilled by steel body panels. So the structural batteries are including a new function that is not fulfilled by the batteries today. So this means that at system level, uh, the structural batteries are performing worse when it comes to maintaining structural integrity with, compared to steel, for example. And maybe they are performing worse compared to store, storing energy when it comes to uh, compared to the lithium ion battery. But they provide benefits at system level. And this is something that we cannot capture if you only apply a, a function that takes uh, a value function that only consider the performances of the product against the cost. At the same time, we have new interactions that are established within the system. Before we didn't have any connection between the batteries and the body panels, they were separated. But now we are actually integrating them. So when it comes to the structural batteries, we have benefits at system level, but at the same time, it increases the complexity for the manufacturer. So again, we have a trade-off between the functionality that we can improve in a system and the complexity and the cost that is going to bring to the manufacturer. And uh, well, Basically, this way of visualizing the, uh, the, the functions and the solutions in a system, I use this, uh, this representation technique that is developed at our division, developed originally by Professor Johanneson, that is a function, enhanced function means tree. And this one will, will come later on in the, in the, in the presentation. So uh, this is a representation that I will use later on. Another reason for introducing technology is basically to reduce the mechanical complexity of a product. And for this, uh, I, I take an example from a fluid management system for satellites. So if we look at these two management systems, they basically provide the same function. So if we look at our value function, they are providing exactly the same performance because they are reducing the, xeno, uh, they are reducing the gas pressure from a tank from 300 bar to 100 bar. So their performance is exactly the same. But as you can see visually, now uh, the mechanical complexity is reduced because you reduce the number of mechanical elements in the system, such as the valves. Uh, this one you reduce and you can compare, if you compare the two CAD models, you can see that the one in the right is much simpler than the one on the left. So we maintain the same function but by introducing new technologies that are a little bit more complex uh, in, in, the, in the system number two, we can reduce the entire mechanical complexity uh, of the system. But also we have the problem that we are introducing more electronics and software in these types of products. 
So we are, for example, introducing more control loops. So we basically manage the function through electronics and software rather than mechanical elements. So the problem here is that we do not know. So in theory, the system number two, the system on the right is simpler than the one in the left. But since we have increased the, the electronic and software complexity compared to the mechanical complexity, we do not know if the system in the right is actually, is actually uh, more or less complex than the system on the left. Because if we look only at the mechanical and hydraulic elements, it, it, is, more sim it is more simple. But if we look at the electronic and software, it's more complex. And by this, I visualized it by having a bigger control unit uh, up. So when we are trying to introduce technologies to reduce complexity, uh, we actually may underestimate the risk that we have. Uh, we may underestimate the complexity reduction that we have in the system. The third reason and the last reason that I will talk about is that we want sometimes to introduce new technologies, not to improve the performance of the product, not to reduce the complexity of the product, but actually to improve what we what can we call the non-functional requirements of a product, such as, for example, flexibility. Here I have an example of three different, uh, four different alternatives for uh, uh, an electric uh, propulsion system for satellites, and basically the option three and four here. Uh, the difference is that you can see here that they perform actually worse when it comes to performances. For example, the power is much less in option three and option four, but the benefits that they provide is that they actually can, uh, they allow the manufacturer to change the type of, uh, the type of gas that we can use if, if, there is, uh, if, if the one type of gas is more beneficial to another. So here we have two types of gases, xenon and krypton. So, Compared to the option number one, where we only use, can use xenon, the option three and the option four allow to easily change the type of gas. So the performances actually here are actually worse, but we provide benefits in terms of flexibility. So often flexibility is then, so the flexibility is a typical non-functional requirement or is also, also referred to as elities because it's flexibility. And uh, uh, so there are things that are not related to the performance, but that actually have an impact uh, when, if there is a change. And these elities often, such as flexibility, are very difficult to be judged and quantified compared to performances. So for example, it's very difficult in a decision situation to motivate the fact that the design concept reduces the performances but increases flexibility. Because often it is asked, okay, what is the impact on the business case? So often when it comes to no functional requirements, they are difficult to judge and quantify and to be motivated if we compare only to the functional requirements of a product and the performance. So often we have the static relation between the engineering view and the business view hinders the, path, the pace of innovation. So there is a need basically to, uh, to trade the functional requirement against non-functional requirement when it comes to value. So if I should summarize the reasons for technology integration, the first that we have looked with the example of the structural batteries is that one of the reasons is that is to improve the functionality and performance of the product. Here we have two challenges. One that is that there is a trade-off between the benefits that we gain with the complexity that we add to the system. And the other one is what we can be called the values in isolation versus at system level, which the structural batteries are an example for. If you, if you only look at the function of the structural batteries, they perform worse compared to current batteries. But if you look at system level, they are providing benefits. And today we do not have techniques for doing this analysis. The second is uh, to introduce new technologies is to reduce the mechanical complexity of a product. But the problem here is that we, we risk of making the wrong assumption regarding the real reduction of complexity. So again, if you look at the system on the right, it looks simpler than the one in the left. 
but actually it's because we have introduced much more electronics and software, which are very difficult to grasp and quantify because you cannot, you cannot basically physically separate them as you can do with mechanical elements in a CAD model. So it's very difficult to trade between domains, taking mechanical, hydraulics, electronics, and software into the same, into, the, into consideration. And the third one for introducing new technologies is to improve non-functional requirements or elities. So it's basically difficult to trade the non-functional requirements with the functional requirements and unit cost. And I will give you an example of how this has been tackled into the project later on. So again, to summarize, if we take early definition of value that was looking into function and, you, and cost and product cost as the basis for analyzing the value of a system, this one is not sufficient anymore because we have new technologies that basically do not work in this way. So if we evaluate them in this way, there is the risk that we neglect uh, technologies that actually bring value to the system. So then there are new definition of values. I, as you can see from 72 to 2006, this is a definition that actually we use in our courses in product development. One is from Per Lindstedt that basically the, the, defines value as the perceived stakeholder benefits divided by the use of stakeholder resources. So, and the perceived stakeholder benefits, they can be functionality, of course, but then these elities and the use of stakeholder resources can be time, money, and effort. So not only cost, but other dimensions. But as you can see, function and product cost, we can easily evaluate. Perceived stakeholder benefits and use of, uh, of stakeholder resources are very difficult to judge and quantify. And quantify. This is why there is, a, a, and again, the elities, they can be flexibility, manufacturability, commonality, upgradability, maintainability. So this is why they are called elities because they end in elity. So this is why then there is a big bunch of research. You can see now 2012, there is a big bunch of research that is trying to quantify value when it comes to the perceived stakeholder benefits in measures that are easier for the engineers. And here they use a lot of what, what is called surplus value. So surplus value is a financial metric that is basically more practical for engineers. But there is the challenge of being able to translate from perceived stakeholder benefits into money. So the research gap here is how can we go from perceived stakeholder benefits to monetary value? And this is why it's an ongoing research that I work on. This is why I will give now an example of uh, value techniques that I developed uh, over the course of these four years at Chalmers and, uh, and even before in my PhD. And I will give a lot of examples that are from this project that I work on that is uh, called KEOPS. that is basically related to electric propulsion system for satellites. And uh, uh, here we have uh, uh, Basically, you can see a lot of companies and a lot of institutions involved in this, uh, in this project. So, and uh, I will give you now a, a brief introduction to electric propulsion uh, just after I drink. So, why do we, why this, do this company want to develop electric propulsion system for satellites? Well, because today the current techno established technologies is chemical propulsion, which is used in rockets such as the space shuttle. Uh, the benefit of chemical propulsion is that it produces a strong acceleration or thrust, but it requires a lot of fuel and propellant. So the problem with chemical propulsion is what you can see on the shuttle on this thing in orange. And this one is the propeller tank. So the propeller tank has to be almost twice than the spacecraft in order to use like chemical propulsion. So the, 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 the negative side is that you bring a lot of launch costs if you use chemical propulsion. An alternative is electric propulsion, which is the object of, uh, of chaos, in which basically electric propulsion, you you use a gas 
typical xenon from a tank, you need to manage this fluid in order to produce the thrust inside the thruster unit. And for this one, you need a power processing unit that manages all this control inside the, uh, um, the system. So the benefit of electric propulsion is that it requires much less propellant. So this propellant tank is much uh, smaller than the one that you have in chemical propulsion. The problem is that you produce a very low acceleration compared to chemical propulsion. You produce an acceleration that is something like this. But since you are in vacuum in space, you do not need that much acceleration. So often these systems are used, once you use chemical propulsion to bring them in orbit, then to bring to an initial orbit, they go to the final orbit using electropropulsion. And then they will do the maneuvering with using electropropulsion. What is interesting about uh, an electropropulsion system is that you can see that it's very multidisciplinary. And now I use the same notation I used at the beginning of this presentation. So I use red for the mechanical interfaces that you have with the satellite platform. I use blue for the fluidic. I use the green for electric and I use the gray for the software. So you can see that here we have all, all these four domains inside this system. So it's, it's very multi-domain product, we can say. And uh, what the, why is KOPS very interesting from a value perspective? Is because there is a, a change business scenario now in the space industry. So in this curve, I am basically plotting the cost of the product versus the production volume that you have every year. So normally the space industry was very characterized by monolithic products that were produced in very low production volumes and they costed a lot. And often they had very, they had governmental pro programs as buyers. So in this context, the unit cost of the product was compromised in favor of performances. So the product could cost a bit more in order to provide, in order to increase the performances of this product. Now, actually, there are new commercial actors coming in the picture. So, for example, this one is OneWeb. So, their business is basically to cover the entire Earth with small satellites in order to provide internet coverage to the whole Earth. And uh, while this could be controversial by some, but you can think in terms of the development effort that you can, uh, the development that you can bring to the entire earth. But what is interesting from our perspective is that in this case, the production volumes are going to increase much more compared to the current business. And here the performances can be compromised in favor of unit cost reduction. So the normal trade-off that was done in the commercial business, in, in, uh, in the traditional business, now it's totally changed into the new, into the new, new businesses. So it makes that people have, engineers have to think differently. But then you have another factor that comes into play is that you do not, not anymore have to account for performances and unit cost as you did today. But now there is that this non-functional requirement when it comes to this very high production volume, they start to have a much bigger role compared to the traditional businesses. For example, you have a much bigger impact of manufacturability because now you don't produce anymore one product, but you produce hundreds or thousands of products every year. So the manufacturability of the product all of a sudden start to become much more important. The integration complexity start to become much more important when you are at this, with these production volumes. Flexibility start to become much more important. So you see that these elites, they start to become much more important because they become a source of cost, of hidden source and revenue losses. So there is a much bigger need of also including these non-functional requirements inside the trade-off when engineers do the trade-off. So this is why, this is the reason why I worked in chaos, we can say. And for this, I will give you now some of the techniques that we applied in chaos 
and basically that are based after three years of action research study. Action research is when you go into the field, you talk to the engineers, you try out a method, you get the practitioner's feedback and you try to modify it. So this is, it has to be continuously iterated. And I work with the nine companies in five different countries, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Germany, and Belgium. And here we give just some examples of these techniques. And uh, uh, I will go quite briefly to them and then we can discuss more about them afterwards if you are interested. But I will basically talk about the value creation strategies, how we use these EFM trees that we saw before to estimate integration complexity. Then I will talk about surplus value models that I used and the trade-off coefficients. So the value creation strategies, we use them in order to capture uh, in the early design stages, what brings value for these companies. So here it was basically a rank weighting of the different needs that the system has. And we try to balance both the performances that are interest for the operators, for example, the transfer time, the precision in operation, with non-functional requirements that are more interested for, interesting for the manufacturer, such as product manufacturability, uh, and flexibility, and so on. So this one is something that we have used in the early stages. Once the engineers came up with the concepts for the electric propulsion system, that we use surplus value models. In the surplus value models, we were trying to assess the different design concepts against a financial metric where we take into account the revenues and the cost for this product over time. So we basically mapped the entire life cycle phase, uh, the, the entire life cycle of the product, and we calculated the revenues and the cost for the different phases, for the different design concepts. So we were trying to combine the engineering view with the decision maker view. So, for example, we then made a, uh, so this is a parallel coordinate chart where we visualize the different design concepts against the different, different dimensions of the product. So each of these lines is basically a different design concept. And uh, we try then to balance uh, the, the needs of the product for the different stakeholders. And we try to balance both the cost, the performances such as thrust, but also these non-functional requirements such as the development efficiency or the integration complexity. So these non-functional requirements that have an impact on the product. And then we, then the most interesting ones that we calculated the surplus value for. So we did a quantification of value drivers of surplus value in this concept, in this stage. So just to give you an example, a very schematic example of the type of analysis that we were doing in this project, uh, I can take this example where you can see the line in blue here where we have the surplus value in kilo euro over time. This one is the example of this blue line here. So this blue line, there was a higher unit cost compared to the green line but actually a higher reliability. So with this, we could justify the blue concept bringing more value compared to the red concept because it was okay to increase the unit cost a little bit to improve the reliability. And this one was done in the applications that were a little bit more traditional, we can say. So where we still had this monolithic system to be developed. But then we did, uh, other interesting uh, analysis when it comes to the new um, markets, such as the OneWeb, where we produce a lot of satellites. Here, we're not only accounting for reliability or unit cost or the performances of the product, but we were actually motivating these non-functional requirements that otherwise will be neglected or will not be included in these type of trade-offs, not at least quantitatively. For example, again, if we compare the red line and the blue line, we can see that this product had a lower unit cost, but actually was, had a lower development efficiency so that you can see that the blue line is taking more time to generate revenue. And this one is because the lead time 
is very, very high. And for these products where the lead time is basically driving most of the value, this is, uh, is not going to be beneficial. So another one that was interesting to observe was how the engineers used it. So the engineer used it not only to visualize the value of the different concepts, but actually they tried to experiment with this model in order to derive what they call the trade-off coefficient. So basically they were doing, they were experimenting by modifying some, some values of the system and to see what was the impact on the surplus value. For example, they were trying to understand, okay, but if I do a dream, uh, if we have a concept that increases the mass by one kilo, but we improve the thrust and we improve the other dimensions, what is going to be the net effect? And actually then we're doing these relative changes on the surplus value. And actually they were looking into them, the sum of this, uh, of this and quite quickly could actually understand if a new concept was actually beneficial or not. For example, in this case, the sum is minus 73 million euro. It means that this specific concept is actually not going to bring value. So quite easily they could with these coefficients, they could use them to, to assess new concepts that were not included in the original analysis. Then quite quickly, and I'm about to finish, but I will, I will give you just some teasers of uh, other types of analysis that, they, that we did in this project. One was regarding flexibility. And I explained before that the problem here was to assess an architecture in which we do not allow to be flexible. So we do not allow to change the type of propellant from xenon to krypton. But instead of the option three and the option four, we give this opportunity to change propellant. But with the downside of bringing lower performances and lower reliability compared to the option number one. So, and this one is on this paper that you can actually uh, download or read if you're interested. But uh, so again, we were trying then to quantify flexibility in this stage. So what we did was basically that we were introducing variability market characteristics. So if we actually, if we actually look at only one market with nominal values, so not taking into account variability of these parameters, the option number one, the single development was the best because it was bringing benefits to the stakeholders. But when we started instead to do a Monte Carlo simulation, where we tried to change, especially the prices of cost of crypto and xenon over time, and we did a, a thousands, a thousands of simulations, then, then the result was very different. When we tried to introduce variability, so we introduced the benefit of flexibility, then the value of option number three and option number four was actually higher than the option number one, because the option number one, when the, the crypto becomes more beneficial, you cannot change into crypto because your alternative doesn't allow you to change. Instead, the other two alternatives allow you to change. So this is how we value flexibility and introduce it into the trade-off. Another one was uh, uh, how we evaluated integration complexity. And for here, we use the EFM trees, where we try to break down different systems for satellites into four different domains, mechanical, hydraulic, electronics, and software. You can see that the notations are exactly the same that I uh, used for this presentation. So red are mechanical interfaces, uh, blue, hydraulic, green, electronics, and gray software. So these options, you can see that they have a different combinations of elements between the four different domains. So with the EFM trees, we were able to capture this variability between domains. And then we, exp we use them. So when we did this work, then we could use, for example, design structure metrics where we map these interfaces along these four different domains. And then we were calculating complexity based on the individual and interface complexity. And for this one, we were using uh, circuit diagrams and CAD models to estimate this individual complexity of the elements. And then the topological complexity or the complexity of the structure, we were using, um, we were using another type of metric. And then these complexity metrics were linked to a development cost model so that we included that in the surplus value model. So with this one, 
with this work, we could actually be able to trade off if it is better to reduce the mechanical complexity and to increase the electronic complexity. Here is show the software complexity, for example, or if it is better to, to go the other way around, to reduce the software complexity and to increase the mechanical complexity because the net effect was more beneficial. So now I almost finished. Uh, so the key takeaways are basically that when we have multi-technology integrated products, they bring value to customers and stakeholders when we try to combine technologies from different domains. Uh, but basically they in, increase the inherent complexity for the manufacturer. So we often have the trade-off between the functionality that we can bring to the customers, but the, the complexity that we have to accept or we have to risk in order to provide these benefits. And then the second is that they are dependent on the combination effect between technologies. And if you remember, the structure of batteries was quite an example for that. So basically, if you use current definitions of value, such as function versus cost, we do not capture all these, these new elements that these new technologies bring into the picture. And this is why we require novel uh, assessment techniques in order to go from an evaluation for in isolation, where we try to compare two technologies without taking into account the system, where we try instead to take into account the effects on the overall system. And then for this, I, uh, I basically gave an example of different value uh, assessment techniques that I used in the KEOPS project. And basically they have been provided, uh, they have been, uh, uh, the feedback that we received is that they are beneficial. And here there is a quote from, uh, from a company. And basically they are beneficial because they, uh, they enable the engineers to present and communicate the value of the different products to, uh, to, the, to the customer and the stakeholders and the program managers. Then the ability, they have the ability to foster monetary value assessment down to subsystem and components, which is something that they don't do today. And the ability of, they, they have also the ability of communicating ranges and explore the effect of sensitive data in these models. Uh, but of course, one thing that was mentioned is that these models have become very data intensive and the uncertainty that are coming into this model, of course, are high. So future work is basically to, it will be to, uh, basically finding ways of validating these value models. For example, using the concept of a digital twin so that we try to reuse as much as possible the data that are coming from actual products in use or products that are actually tested today in order to validate the value models so that we can explore new concepts, but based on, uh, on the products that are in use today or that they are, have been tested today. So the future work will be actually to use the concept of a digital twin to have what I call here digital twin driven uh, value assessment. So this is basically to be able to validate these value models in the early design stages. And for this one, I thank you so much for your uh, attention. Well, thank you very much. Massimo, that was a good lecture, and uh, I think we can ask people to to uh, register any questions on the chat. I guess Ali, I will uh, check on that, and uh, I can start with uh, one question. Yeah. Um, what? Uh, although you said it already, but what do you think yourself is the main uh, contribution of your work compared to the, the theories that you have referred to? I think that uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, as I show in the references, uh, uh, this monetary value assessment and a lot of these techniques have been developed in these years, but they have not gone to the subsystem level and the component level for which I'm using it in, in my research. So they have been remained into the, what we can call the systems engineering domain. And this is why our research group is called the systems engineering design, I think is because we are trying, I am trying to bring these techniques at a much lower level, uh, where we look into the difference, small differences between, uh, between components and so on. And this is something that hasn't been taken into account before. Does it make a difference? 
I think you've shown that already. For engineers? Yes. Well, uh, I would, I, well, <laughs> the interest has been, uh, it's been, has been very good. And also not only from uh, the companies in Kelps, but also, for example, when I presented at ESA, so there are companies like uh, Airbus, for example, that would like to continue. And uh, they actually asked me if uh, there is a way for me to create a tool so that they can use these techniques without me being present. So I would say that uh, there is a preliminary interest and impact already. Okay, uh, we can have more discussion, but I think we can turn to the audience in the room or in, online. Uh, I actually have a question. Um, so the EFM method, yeah. there you describe your functional requirements for the product and design solutions to this. Should you see some type like of expansion to it where you incorporate uh, non-functional requirements as flexibility, for example? How would you model that? Yeah, so, well, actually the EFM model takes already into account this non-functional requirement in some way through an object that I didn't show that are constraints. So basically we, but basically it's an element that we attach to a design solution. It could be do a simple, well, the mechanical valve, for example, if there is a constraint related to any other type of the life cycle phases, could be uh, in manufacturing, but it could be flexibility. So then we can attach that in the EFM. And actually, not me, but my PhD student is actually working on the test testing ability constraints, if we can say so, uh, that can be attached into a model like this and how that can be used then for a value assessment later on. Uh, you want in the room as a question? Yeah, so there's uh, a lot of uh, things where you are well, discussing definitions, wordings like is a technology integration of the function sharing and what is a concept really and so forth. So yeah. uh, John here, but there's also many assumptions that were made. So so maybe on your and sort of qualitative this. So maybe on your last slide. Uh, this one or uh, the, one with the digital twin? Yes. This one. Yeah. yeah. So here we are uh, trying to understand the uh, relationship between surplus value and wall thickness. Yeah. And here you have a, a multi minimum function for that. Yeah. Does it really make sense to have a, a relationship like that between wall thickness and so this value, what is the uh, sort of physical, physical uh, grounding for, for that to uh, appear? Well, you have to consider that this one is the, it's a, uh, so you have to consider that you have an impact that goes in this way. So basically the wall thickness is something that is inside, is inside this design solution. So. Of course, you have the combined effect. So there, I, I just show it on, on the visual, uh, visual level. <laughs> but the idea is actually that uh, you, do a co you should do then a combined effect between uh, the different parameters of the different concepts. So of course, it's not easy. <laughs> but the idea is actually to combine, to combine multiple relationships inside the, what is actually the surplus value at the end at system level. So the intuitive thing is that it sort of is a trade-off maybe going up and down a little bit. Here you have multiple not a, it's a bit totally counterintuitive for me. That, uh, well you have to consider yes. I mean if we look uh, I think I understand what it, what you mean because this one is like this but if we change things in other side of the system this one is actually going to go in another way. Yeah. Well, that one, this one is actually what we want to arrive is that you, you have these combination effects that, so um, you want to be able to capture these combination effects, which now are, of course are not visualized, but that if you change, uh, I don't know, but another part of the system, this curve is actually going to, to, to change, which is, but this one is, uh, is basically things that current, data mining techniques are trying to take into account with the covariate analysis, for example, where you try to understand if 
changing one parameter is actually depending on changing another parameter and so on. So technically, uh, there are there is research about it. Then that is not a straightforward uh, thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. If there are any questions online, please uh, raise your hand now. Otherwise, we I have a final question for you. Uh, perhaps a bit uh, intriguing one. I don't know. But uh, you've shown that it's possible to capture and represent and make quantitative relations and make sense of that in some sense. At least they're appreciated and that makes an impact. Uh, do you think that everything can and should be quantified that drives some kind of value? Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> this is a question that, uh, of course, it's... Um, it's... Uh, it's a very intuitive question. <laughs> so it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's really discussed, for example, when it comes to sustainability benefits, those are very difficult to judge and quantify. Uh, I still think that today there is a big, too much of a big gap between the things that you cannot quantify and the things that you can quantify. So for me, we should, you will not be able to possibly to capture, to quantify everything, but if we can, stretch a bit the line between the things that we can quantify or these things that we cannot quantify today, I think that that will be already a benefit because then we can, we can start as an engineer, we can start at least to discuss, for example, sustainability at a much more concrete level than what is happening today. Otherwise, today the discussions are, oh, but we cannot quantify that. And so either it remains on the very high political level or on the utopia level than when it comes to the engineering side, which is not going to. I think that this, the line should be stretched a bit towards the things that we cannot quantify as much as possible quantitatively, then still keeping the fact that we, we need to have uh, good leaders and so then we get into the soft skills of decision makers, which is something that we cannot do something, at least for my research, I cannot do something about it. It's someone else's ability. Okay. But it, it can be discussed quite a lot, but uh, that we can also do beyond the project because I think you will continue to do research in the area. So um, um, with that, we can uh, close now the, the session by inviting uh, our head of division, Ayn Museo because you now completed your, your lecture. So uh, this was uh, the promotion lecture to um, be promoted to the degree that we call Oavlana docent in Swedish, associate professor. So it's a non-paid docent, if I translate it to English. It's a Scandinavian title and it does exist in Germany as well. Uh, I'm not sure if it's um, uh, so common in Anglo-Saxon countries. Um, this is the last step to actually do the promotion lecture, which I think you did very well. And the process before is um, uh, the docent degree is basically a second PhD degree. So that means that uh, Massimo has done research on his own, presented uh, research uh, publications, and also been evaluated by a scientific committee. And uh, the committee gave a very positive uh, result. So uh, on behalf of, of the department, and uh, after I've done this promotion lecture, I will hand, off this, hand over this diploma, which uh, is the final proof that you have reached uh, the docent degree. It's signed by our head of department who has been with us on Zoom, but he couldn't join us physically. So uh, uh, congratulations, congratulations, Thank Massimo. You. Very well done. And, um, I hand over the diploma. Thank you. So you can call yourself uh, docent now. Ah, that's and nice. um, uh, well, we, we do have the difference between employment as a docent and uh, the title OABLANA docent, but the degree is docent. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have flowers, but I'm, I'm not uh, handing them over. And, okay. Oh, I can. I'll be sanitized properly. So, also the flowers. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. With that, I think we can. Uh,
close the, uh, the official session and uh, thank you for everyone who attended online. And uh, I'm sure Massimo will be around if you want to follow up any questions or comments later on. So uh, thank you for this and we close the, the online session. Thank you.